So I just see people are, are joining, so I'm just going to wait a minute or two and then uh, we'll start the seminar. Okay, um, thank you everybody for, for joining today. Um, I will get started. Um, I will just give a brief introduction to the Materials Project Seminar Series before uh, handing it over to our speaker. So um, the Materials Project Seminar Series is a new initiative. Uh, this is only our third seminar. Um, the intent was to um, have a venue for monthly talks from top researchers in our field um, focused on topics of interest specifically for the materials project community. So these could be uh, including computational materials design, the use of materials project tools to perform research, or machine learning applied to materials research, um, among other topics. So um, even though this is only the third seminar, we've already had a lot of fun um, offering this and it's been really nice. Um, to be able to share stories from our community and to receive uh, questions and, and feedback um, from people who use Materials Project. So um, the talk will be about 45 minutes um, and afterwards there'll be a time for questions and answers. Uh, please use the Q&A button in Zoom um, to ask questions and uh, we will moderate these questions as they come in. Um, for anybody who's watching a recording of this afterwards, um, you can also ask questions um, about the talk on our forum. Um, which uh, we may or may not be able to reply to um, depending on, on time constraints. Um, the recordings will be cross-posted um, a few days after the talk to our YouTube channels. Um, this seminar is co-organized by the Materials Project and also the Materials Virtual Lab at UC San Diego. And um, finally, um, speaker nominations are welcome. Um, people have already sent some in. We're going through the list. Um, I do want to emphasize that all career stages are welcome to apply. Um, so this includes graduate students. Um, ideally, um, a suggested speaker will have an associated peer-reviewed publication um, so that we can evaluate uh, whether the topic would be relevant to the community. Um, but this is really meant to be open for everybody. So um, uh, please do apply or suggest a colleague if you're interested. So um, our next seminar um, after today will be on October 13th. Um, this will be on deep learning and quantum computation methods uh, from Kamal Chowdhury at uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And uh, we have November and December speakers uh, to be announced shortly. Um, today's speaker, who um, I'm very happy to welcome, is uh, Sinead Griffin. Sinead Griffin is a staff scientist in the Molecular Foundry and the Materials Science Division at Berkeley Lab. Um, originally from Ireland, um, her work as a theorist focuses on the description and discovery of quantum materials and physical phenomena at the nanoscale. Um, the applications of Sinead's work range from new materials to energy and quantum computing to exploring the origins of the universe. Her awards include the Swiss Physical Society's General Prize and MIT Rising Star in Physics, the Falling Walls Bay Area Young Innovator of the Year Award, and an Emerging Leader from the Institute of Physics. Um, aside from her research, she's involved with building a research network in condensed matter physics in Africa, including being awarded an inaugural American Physical Society Innovation Fund grant to set up a US-Africa workshop and network. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome Sinead today, and I hope you all enjoy her talk. Um, I will now stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Sinead. Super, thanks Matt, and here we go. Okay, great. So um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for um, signing in to hear me talk about probably something that you weren't expecting to hear in a materials project seminar series, um, which is mostly going to be concentrated on probing fundamental physics with the materials project, in particular, how we can use um, the materials project in our search uh, for dark matter. Um, so 
Um, I'm going to briefly, very briefly, um, give you a, a history of, of materials. Um, and I think it's, it, it might be obvious to everyone, but our, our civilization, you know, humans basically turning rocks into computers um, is, is how we measure uh, technological change uh, throughout different uh, throughout different eras in, in history. And so this, this is kind of very epitomized in the fact that we actually call these different eras in history after the predominant materials that the technologies were made from. Um, so this is probably familiar from your you know, primary and, and high school textbooks, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, all the way up into um, modern times where we call it either the information age or the silicon age. And I think there's just been a huge explosion of different types and flavors of materials in the last 100 years that has completely overtaken any, any sort of progress in, in the previous uh, millennia. And um, so here I have, you know, um, a selection of, of these innovations. I'm sorry if your favorite materials class isn't there. Um, and a lot of these materials have also gone hand in hand with, with theoretical advances. Um, so ranging right from, you know, the, the fundamental physics of, of the standard model, you know, what is the, the fundamental constituents of, of the material that we consider, um, right up to how we connect these to, to experiments and to uh, materials that we experience um, on, on an everyday scale in, in the laboratory. And so um, in starting and looking at these sorts of uh, length scales, um, and going from the standard model up to, you know, BAM theory, which is arguably one of the most successful um, theoretical tools in, in predicting and understanding materials, um, right up to uh, uh, Landa Ginsberg theory, which, which um, is a way of describing different types of order parameters and a lot of, uh, a lot of phenomena that have a lot of fundamental technological relevance can be described using this sort of formalism. So th this is, you know, a, a triumph for, for materials theory and the theory of matter in, in the last century. However, two big things are, are kind of thorns in our side, and that is these two things. Um, first off was the discovery and prediction of topological phases of matter that couldn't be described using BAM theory or Landau Ginsberg theory. And, and the second is, is something that's um, hypothesized and there's a lot of indirect evidence for, and that's dark matter. And um, so these are not explained within what was you know, the state of the art 20 years ago um, in, in, in theory of matter, going right from the fundamental to, to how we understand material. So this is exactly what I'm gonna to discuss today, um, is, is how we can use materials informatics, especially to try and um, probe these types of fundamental um, materials issues. Um, I'll start off with discussing new ideas for dark matter detection. And in the second part of my talk, I'll, I'll discuss how we can try and design um, new phases, new topological phases and order parameters in, in materials. Okay, so in the first part, I'll, I'll discuss um, how we can search for this new type of matter um, that goes beyond our conventional paradigms um, using theory, computation and materials informatics. And the first part I said will be um, discussing how we can design and uh, suggest new phenomena and materials to discover dark matter. Um, and in the second part, I'll be discussing how we can think about, again, designing and understanding um, topological phenomena and quantum phenomena that have lots of different order parameters. So we can think about having lots of switches, lots of cross couplings between lots of different order parameters um, that has technological relevance as well. OK, so we'll start off. Um, I'm assuming no one knows what dark matter is, so we'll start off with what is dark matter. Um, and this is the, the, on the right hand side here, I have shown a, a, a simple pie chart of the energy distribution of the universe. Um, and this is all garnered from lots of different types of cosmological and astronomical observations. Um, so you can see here that normal matter, so that's the matter that we're used to dealing with in the materials project, um, only makes up 5% of, of the energy distribution of the universe. So we're really dealing with a really tiny slice of the pie when we think about normal materials. And um, there's five times the amount of dark matter in the universe than there is normal matter. So we're dealing with a huge amount of unknown matter that, that is existing in our universe. Um, on the left hand side are the properties that we actually know about dark matter. So these again are, are, are um, based on different types of observations. Um, the first is that it's cold. And by cold, I mean, it's, it travels 
fairly slowly. So if you think of the speed of light as being, you know, the relativistic speeds very fast, photons travel at the speed of light, of course. Um, cold is that the velocity is much less than that. Actually, we have a velocity distribution of, of dark matter, which um, I'll explain later how actually that comes into some of the calculations that we make. Um, it is non-baryonic. Um, that means it's not made from protons and neutrons like we're used to matter being made from. So uh, we need to start thinking about, well, what else could it be made from and how would we go about thinking, um, thinking about that structure? Um, it is what we call collisionless, which means that it doesn't interact with normal matter very strongly. So we know that already, otherwise we would have found dark matter. So it is, it is, that's why it's difficult to find. It, it doesn't interact very strongly with, with our normal materials, this normal matter sector, so it's called the standard model sector. Um, and as I said, it makes up a lot of the mass density of the universe, so um, there's a lot of it out there for us to detect. Okay, so this, these are the, the kind of standard plots that are used in the dark matter field in high energy physics to, to um, look at and, and give estimates of different types of cross sections for different experiments. So let me explain to you how, how, these, how to read these plots. So on the x-axis here is, is the dark matter mass. Um, and here I have WIMP mask. Um, WIMP stands for weakly interacting massive particle. And um, they're a particular um, model of dark matter. It's weakly interacting. Um, so we know that already. It's one of the possible ways dark matter can interact with normal matter. Um, but this is massive particles. So these are large chunks of dark matter. And on the y-axis here is, is the cross section. So that will be the cross section of that particular mass of dark matter with the particular type of experimental setup that is drawn by the line here. And the key thing about, about dark matter is we do know what the total mass density of dark matter is, but we, the, the thing is we don't know how big the individual chunks are. Um, so when we're thinking about designing detectors for dark matter, um, we actually have to think about, you know, uh, designing experiments that can test different ranges of masses. And that can range from masses like lighter than an electron all the way up to the size of a black hole. So we're talking about orders and orders and orders of magnitudes of masses that dark matter could be. So let's look at this plot here. Okay. So these lines are giving, uh, the, the, these curves, they're called reach curves, are giving you the sensitivity of that particular experiment um, to that range. So uh, one of the, the big experiments is super CDMS. You can see it in this kind of blue line, blue dash line with 2017 on it. And this is a semiconductor based um, experiment. And what this means is that this experiment would be sensitive to the masses on uh, as far as it goes on the left hand side. So, you know, about 20 GeV, 10 GeV of, of WIMP masses. And then the, the cross section is, is going above. So, you know, going up and to the right is the sensitivity that that, that particular experiment would be sensitive to. Um, so then if we start thinking about designing new detectors, well, there's two things we can do. We can first start pushing to higher volume. So you can see there's a bit of white space down here. We can start pushing to higher volumes. It just means making bigger detectors, right? Increasing the mass, increasing the cross-section area. The second thing we can do, and you can see there's a lot of white space over here, is pushing these lines to the left-hand side, which means pushing the lines to being sensitive to lower thresholds or lower dark matter masses. And it's this part that I'm going to discuss today is actually pushing, pushing these lines to the left-hand side to design dark matter detectors that are sensitive to even lower mass dark matter particles. Well, why are we doing this? Well, here's the energy range here. So this low mass dark matter particle energy range is kind of this uh, micro to milli electron volt range all the way to an, a giga electron volt dark matter particle. But if we look at the types of energy scales in quantum materials, that's exactly what we're thinking of. So to give this another way of how, how exactly existing dark matter searches work. Um, I have here just a schematic of how a nuclear recoil dark matter detector experiment works. So this black dot here is our dark matter particle and it comes in with some sort of momentum. And here we have, and the blue is just a nucleus. Um, one of the common nuclear recoil experiments is a xenon, xenon one ton, where they literally have one ton of xenon in, in a large vat. And, and they wait for dark matter to come in and hit off one of the xenon nuclei, and then we try and measure that recoil. Um, and it is really just based on momentum transfer. So we've got momentum coming in, it hits off the nucleus, and dark matter leaves, and we try and measure what, whatever that nuclear recoil was. 
Um, so of course then, whatever the mass of the target is, the mass of the nucleus will determine how sensitive we are to particular masses of dark matter. So for example, if we have mega electron volt dark matter, then we need um, thresholds of about an EV. That's the, the, the um, kinematic um, selection that we get from, from nuclei. So, okay, so we wanna think about then going to lower mass dark matter. Well, we can think about re replacing this nucleus, which is relatively heavy um, and an atomic, uh, at an atomic scale uh, with something lighter. So we can think about explacing with, with an electron and, and measuring electron recoil. And you can see we already start gaining, right? So if we replace this nucleus with something lighter like an electron, um, then we can start thinking about being sensitive to kilo electron volt dark matter. So we're already starting to win by thinking about um, lower energy um, excitations. Um, just to mention here for any, any um, physicists in the audience, um, the types of models in addition to this sort of gravitational scattering um, that we consider when we're doing our estimates are um, both dark photon models. That's essentially where you've got a regular standard model and we have a copy of that in the dark sector. And instead of having photons as the force mediators, like we have in the standard model, we have dark photons as the force mediators. And this is a mixing angle between the photon and the dark photon. So um, we do consider those processes in our estimates. Um, and, and the second one, which I'll really briefly discuss at the end is something called a QCD axion. Um, and this, um, if there's anyone who, who is into multiferroics or magnetoelectrics, this has a term very similar to a magnetoelectric response. So this is a particle um, that has, uh, has this kind of E dot B term. So um, I'll really briefly discuss this at the end of how we can design materials that couple to this. And there's a hint there is that we, we, we look for a similar, um, similar form in the Lagrangian of our material response too. Okay, so um, now how do we start thinking about, about you know, this design problem of, of dark matter detection. So we have um, these particles, these dark matter particles. Um, uh, we don't know what the individual masses are. We don't know if they have any structure, internal structure. Um, and we don't know if they have any quantum numbers like spin. Um, so we really don't know a lot about the properties of these materials. Um, we do know the velocity. Uh, we have a velocity distribution and we do know what the total mass is. So we can give reach curves and estimates on, on what the cross section with our experiments would be. So then the, the kind of design question is, well, how do we design a material or a collection of materials um, that can couple to these unknown quantum, quantum orders and, and these, these unknown masses? So how do we kind of come up with a way of designing a range of materials that will couple to all of these different types of hypothetical particles with, with different mass ranges? Right, so um, I kind of flashed this earlier, um, and on the top here, I have the, the mass range that we're targeting. So we want to push our detectors to this sort of lower dark matter mass range. Um, so we want to look at this sort of orange region, which is in the milli electron volts to giga electron volts region. So this is the, the type of dark matter that we, we have no existing, um, no existing running operational experiments for. So we want to start designing these types of experiments. Um, and on the bottom here, I have, um, you know, solid state physics, um, quick plot of energy scales and materials. And actually, because of the, the range that we're looking for in these low mass dark matter particles coincides with the energy scales in, in quantum materials. So going right from, you know, crystal fields and band gaps for the order of EVs, all the way down to phonons, down to things like the zhelazhinsky maria interaction, that's precisely the energy range in materials responses that we need to be sensitive for these sorts of dark matter models. Um, I briefly mentioned here as well, this is just based on energies. So this is just, you know, matching up well, this is the energy scale of the dark matter interactions with materials that we need. Here are the energy, relevant energy scales and quantum materials that fulfill those criteria. We can also envision different types of couplings as well. If, if dark matter has, for example, quantum numbers like spin, then we can start thinking about coupling to spin as well. Um, but this is purely based on energetics. Okay, so today I'm going to discuss um, three of these examples, um, two in, in a little bit of detail and one I'll mention briefly. Um, I'll talk about spin orbit interactions, designing spin orbit interactions, um, phonons for dark matter detection, and briefly at the end I'll mention um, something called axion coupling, which can be um, designed, um, we can design a material um, with a Zhelazhinsky type Maria interaction um, that, that is sensitive to this sort of coupling. 
Okay, so these are the three that I'll discuss today. So I'm going to start off with this spin orbit interaction um, uh, type of uh, detection idea for dark matter. Okay, so um, I mentioned already that, you know, as we go to, to lower mass targets, so lower mass, either electron scattering or quasi particle scattering, um, we, we need to start thinking about lower energy thresholds. And two of the um, two of the types of processes that we consider here, I just have a kind of a cartoon of a of a Dirac semi metal. Um, so these Dirac semi metals are, are um, types of topological materials um, that have these sorts of linear crossings. And basically, the Fermi level is right through this pinch point, right through the center of this cone. And so if we've got this type of, of band structure, we can have dark matter that uh, comes in and basically kicks an electron from the valence to the conduction band, or you can also have uh, absorption by dark matter. So these are the two processes that, that we consider. Um, but to, to when we take in these sorts of matrix elements and, and look at the cross section, and um, we can come up with a shopping list of materials properties that we need to optimize this type of interaction. Um, so to, to maximize this cross section, um, a material should have the following properties at four Kelvin, because four Kelvin is actually the, the common operational detectors of these types of dark matter experiments. And um, so, you know, we're kind of lucky in a way because we're doing DFT at zero Kelvin, but we're, we're getting pretty close to what the operational temperature of these will be. Um, so uh, first off, we, we want a gap as small as possible, but we do want a finite gap so that we're not getting too many dark counts. So we want a, a small gap of the order of milli electron volts. Um, we do want something close to a Dirac dispersion. Um, and that means a linear, linear dispersion at the Fermi level. Um, the reason for this is because we want the Fermi velocities to be in a certain mass range to optimize the kin kinematic matching with the, the velocity range of dark matter. So that's, that's not a, a kind of a requirement, it's a preferred criteria because it actually optimizes the, the, the cross-section amplitude. Um, so as I said, we want these kind of relatively small Fermi velocities. So um, these, these values are just taken by optimizing that kinematic matching with the velocity distribution of dark matter. Um, but I do mention here that we want, um, and, and there, previously it had been suggested that, that graphene, and there's actually a, a, an experiment called Ptolemy in, in Italy that is looking at graphene as a dark matter detector. Um, but for this type of interaction, um, the, the Fermi velocities in graphene are actually too high. Um, uh, we, we do want anisotropic Fermi velocities, and I'll explain why we want that in, in a little bit when I give you a materials example. And, and finally, we want a large cone degeneracy. And by that, I mean, we just want as many electrons available as scattering as possible, because you know, the more electrons that are available um, in our detector, then the greater the cross section will be. Okay, so, oh, so here is, is um, our strategy for finding this. So can we find ultra low band gap materials? And, and this work was done by um, postdoc in my group, Katie Anzani, um, in col collaboration with uh, Annabab James group, especially Alareza, who, who did some of this. Um, so what we want to do is, is identify semiconductors with mini electron volt band gaps. Um, so uh, here is just a schematic, a reminder, again, what, what we're discussing is we've got low mass dark matter. So we've got this uh, energy deposition on the electron. So this is the type of um, energy range in the band gaps that we need to be sensitive to those sorts of low mass particles. However, um, those of us who know DFT know that we have problems with, with accurately calculating band gaps in, in, in um, standard vanilla DFT. Um, so we know that we, we underestimate band gaps in, in, in regular DFT. So instead of doing this, we thought of a way of circumventing this problem. So rather than just doing a search for low band gap materials, which we don't expect to be very accurate given given this the shortcoming of, of standard DFT and you know if we don't want to go to very heavy hybrid calculations or GW calculations is there another way we can think about of, of finding some of these types of materials so our idea was in, instead of just looking for low band gap materials we could search for materials where they have a band gap that's open by spin orbit coupling because spin orbit coupling is the magnitude is in the sorts of low MEVs, tens of MEVs range, depending on the particular chemistries that we have. And that gives us the appropriate sort of energy scale and band gap opening that gives us the right properties for this material. So this is precisely what we're looking for is we look for a material um, that is metallic or doesn't have a gap when we don't include spin orbit coupling. 
and opens up a gap when we do include spin orbit coupling. Okay, so this is precisely what we did with the materials project. Um, we, at the time, um, which was, I think, about two years ago when we started this search, uh, there were about 86 inorganic materials in the materials project, and just over 4,000 of those had spin orbit, um, spin orbit interactions included in the calculation. So um, our search kind of narrowed down to these 4,000 compounds that, that there was spin orbit coupling data available. Um, so then the next question was um, this criteria of when we turn off spin orbit coupling that are metallic and when we turn on spin orbit coupling that a gap opens up. So that gave us a very clear um, search criteria to start down selecting these 4,357 compounds. And so when we did this, we called these would-be metals, right? So um, they, they look like they're metals without spin orbit coupling and there's, there's a small gap when we include spin orbit coupling. And when we did this, we actually found three. Three materials was the result of this search out of the over 4,000 compounds. Um, so these three classes of materials then were, were refined using um, higher level density functional theory. So, you know, uh, ensuring that we were getting, you know, appropriate band gaps by doing hybrid functional calculations, et cetera. And when we did this, we actually found one family of materials. Um, and these were tin panictides that have the right range of ME scale band gaps um, that fulfill what our search criteria was. And actually, um, this, this band gap in these panictides is, is actually variable by composition. So I'll explain exactly how, how we can tune that band gap um, depending on the chemistries, particular chemistries that we find. Okay, so the first um, thing to look at is this is the crystal structure on the left-hand side. It's a rhombohedral crystal structure. It's, it's layered. Um, so these white kind of peachy atoms are the strontium. Um, the tin is the pink and the arsenic is, is the, um, the navy blue or purple. Um, and the important structural feature to focus on here is actually the tin arsenic bonding. So you can see it's got this, this corrugated layer, um, this kind of zigzag layer um, in, in this, in this um, structure. Okay, so we, we know that we have on the right hand side, here is the projection of the tin and arsenic. Um, on, on the x-axis here, I just have a direction near gamma in the rion zone, on the y-axis is the energy, and zero here is the Fermi level. So here on the left-hand side, we have the calculation, band structure calculation without spin orbit coupling, and on the right-hand side is with spin orbit coupling. So um, you can see here, this is precisely the kind of would-be metal, where on the left-hand side, we have these bands crossing, and on the right-hand side, it gaps out. Um, these are primarily comprised of this tin and arsenic. Um, at PZ. So you can see this, this, um, this uh, crossing in, in this tin and arsenic PZ when you include spin orbit coupling um, causes an anti-crossing, which gives you this band gap opening. Okay, so then we're thinking about, well, do we have a way of starting to tune this material? So it, it, it appears from these calculations that this band gap opening is caused by spin orbit coupling. So maybe we can, you know, increase this band gap by moving to heavier elements. So we go to the periodic table, and start replacing um, our, our uh, making substitutions in our crystal structure, um, isovalent substitutions to see if we can increase that bind gap size. So our hypothesis was um, that increasing and uh, moving down the periodic table will cause spin orbit coupling to increase and that would in turn increase the gap um, opened by spin orbit coupling. So we did these calculations and here's the series. Um, so on the top here is the band structure calculations, including spin orbit coupling. So you've, we've got the manganese compound, the calcium, the strontium, and then we did barium and strontium, or uh, uh, strontium again with, with uh, phosphorus instead of arsenic in the last one. Uh, again, this is the full band structure. The x-axis is the direction in, in the Brion zone and the y-axis is the energy where the Fermi level is mark marked by the dashed line. And then I've got a zoomed in version of, of the interesting part of the band structure. So where that, where that band inversion is happening and we get this small gap material. So the manganese case, okay, that's kind of a bust because we get a full reshuffling of the bands and it's just metallic. Um, in, in the rest of the cases though, we see something interesting. So here um, we, we get, in the calcium case, we do get a metal, right? Because we get this band structure crossing this, but you can imagine like maybe with a little bit of, of strain or pressure, we could kind of move that Fermi level around and, and put it, thread it through the gap. Well, the interesting thing here is um, we can see this, this um, band gap. So if we look at, you know, from, from the top of, 
the valence to the bottom of the conduction band, we actually see this band gap decreasing as we increase spin orbit coupling. So we got something that's greater than 60 MeV, we've got 60 MeV, 54 down to 16 MeV. So it's actually opposite to what we we're expecting. The band gap actually decreases as we increase the spin orbit coupling. So what's going on here? And this is actually where the, the structural properties are really important. So um, in this case, as I said, these, these two bands are this tin and arsenic PZ. Well, actually we find when we start replacing this strontium atom, the, the big kind of big um, strontium atom, these group two elements, um, we find that this buckling, this corrugation of these tin and arsenic layers actually mod is modified. So by also going down the periodic table and increasing the spin orbit coupling, we're actually also including like larger, larger atoms in that substitution, which in turn changes, changes the corrugation of these atoms. And that is actually what's causing um, the band gap modulation. In this case, it's because of this PZ, PZ orbital overlap is, is being modified. Um, by this delta, this corrugation of, of, this, of these two layers. Okay, so um, here is, here's kind of our, our tunable band gap materials that are in the energy range that we wanted for dark matter detection. And I just mentioned briefly here, but I'll explain why this is important later. These are also directional. So we get anisotropic um, uh, velocities um, in, in, the, in the electrons in, in, these, um, in these band structures. Okay. So um, I've kind of discussed the spin orbit interaction part. The next one I'm going to discuss is, is phonons. So how dark matter interacts with phonons. Um, and I am really <laughs> briefly going to describe how we calculate this. So uh, here's a simplified version of our cross section. And basically the, the blues are the normal matter. So we've got these, these you know, uh, phonons in our material will be the normal matter in this case. And the chi's here are the dark matter. And how these interact with each other is given by this matrix element. And one of the ways we consider this is, is through this dark photon coupling. So um, there's a mixing angle between the regular photon and the dark photon coupling. What this means for us when we're trying to design a, a material is that we're considering that dark matter has a tiny amount of Coulomb charge on it. So essentially what we're doing is trying to design uh, a detector where we're trying to, trying to be uh, sensitive to, to a particle with a very, very, very tiny amount of charge. So this is, this is what this, um, this uh, basically gives you in the materials requirement. So the, the, the way that we can think about then coupling to phonons is through optical phonons. Um, since we have in, in a, a polar semiconductor or a, a, a diatomic material, uh, we have oscillating dipoles, which will couple to, to light. And um, so this is precisely the mechanism that we're going to start thinking about how dark matter can couple to phonons. So first off, why, why are these interesting for dark matter? Well, first, first thing is this kinematic matching. So we have the right energy scales in phonons, right? Phonons range from, you know, zero MeV to, you know, one or two or 300 MeVs, depending on the type of system you have. Um, they have small screening. Um, they, have, uh, they can have an anisotropic crystal structure. I'll explain why that's important in a second. Um, but really importantly, even for a theorist, uh, there are high quality crystals available now. So you can buy high quality gallium arsenide, um, you know, or gallium nitride that could be made into a detector now. We don't need to do years and years of materials development to build high quality crystals now. And um, the, the other timely issue is that their sensor detector technology is becoming uh, mature right now for these sorts of experiments. Okay, so when we look at how dark matter interacts with these materials, um, here are the kind of materials quality factors that we get when we try and design or look at the materials response for dark matter interacting with phonons. And the two processes that we can consider are just scattering and absorption. So scattering, just basically coming in and, and you know populating a few phonons and trying to measure those, or alternatively absorption of dark matter by, by optical phonons. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to here is, is the blue are the material specific quantity. So the blue in this top one is the nucleon mass, um, the minimum maximum phonon energy. Um, these are all things we can either get from the material or we can, we can actually calculate using DFT. Um, in the bottom case, um, these depend on, on the Born effective charges, the atomic masses, um, dielectric constants, and optical phonon frequencies. Again, quantities that are readily available using first principles calculations. 
So here are results of, of some of our calculations. Again, on the x-axis is the mass of the dark matter particle. On the y-axis is the cross-section. Um, all of these dashed lines are existing experiments. So the super CDMS generation two was the, the one I pointed out previously, which is um, uh, based on silicon. Um, and in the solid lines, so this red solid uh, or pink solid phonon line, um, this is our calculated reach for uh, dark matter interacting with phonons in gallium arsenide. And in this blue solid line, this is dark matter interacting with phonons in sapphire. So you can see we, we do exactly what we wanted. We've really pushed the sensitivity of these curves all the way to the left-hand side. So we've improved these sensitivities by about three orders of magnitude by looking at phonons. But can we do better? So we just, you know, we, we looked at gallium arsenide first because it's, you know, very technologically relevant semiconductor and we can buy high quality gallium arsenide. Um, but can we, can we actually figure out better materials that would be even more sensitive or increase this cross-section to, to, to dark matter? So here are the two um, materials that we, we plotted in the previous one, gallium arsenide and sapphire. And I've pulled out the material specific properties here, the Born effect of charges, the masses, the dielectric constant and the phonon frequency. And I've combined this all into a quality factor, um, which is basically a metric for the magnitude of the cross section with dark matter and these particular phonon modes. So can we do better? Okay, so think about it, material science, um, we, can, we can start playing around with these different quantities. So the first thing we can think about is, is obviously the atomic mass numbers. So can we, you know, we looked at gallium and arsenide. So if we want to increase this quality factor, then we want to reduce the atomic mass number. So we go to the top of the periodic table. And what is, you know, the, the lightest mass combination that gives us optical phonons? Well, lithium fluoride is, is, is um, the answer to that. So going up to the top of the periodic table and looking at lithium fluoride. So we fit, fit these numbers into our metric and we see we already get a huge improvement. So we already get, you know, uh, over three and um, three times enhancement over sapphire by looking at lithium fluoride just by considering lower masses. Um, next thing we can think about is this Born effect of charge, um, or alternatively, you know, Born effect of charge is obviously intimately related to to um, having large electric polarizations. But of course, we can calculate um, or find uh, Born effect of charges, uh, which are included in some of the uh, a lot of the materials project as well. Um, so in doing this, we identified this tungsten oxide in this P4MM structure. Um, so this has actually been previously looked at before for having anomalously high Born effective charges um, by this um, paper by Philippe Gauze and Xavier Gonze. Um, and so as a result of these anomalously large Born effective charges, um, it also has a very high calculated electric polarization of about 70 microcoulombs per centimeter squared. Okay, so let's see what happens when we calculate these Born effective charges and fit them into our quality factor. We, well, we again increase the, the, the quality factor by, by another factor of two. So we're really getting huge improvements by just considering the materials constituents of, of this um, quality factor relation. Okay, I kept on teasing you that uh, anisotropy was really important in these detection experiments. And the reason for this is that there is um, a directionality associated with how dark matter is actually hitting, hitting our experiment. So I have this drawn in this kind of schematic here. So here's our sun. Um, we are these little black dots. And this is how, you know, we, we're rotating um, on an annual basis, but we're also rotating on our own axis. And because of this, um, we actually have a directionality associated with how dark matter is actually hitting us. So there's, the, we, we call it the dark matter wind. It's actually us moving through it, but we call it the dark matter wind, where there's a directionality associated with how dark matter will be hitting our experiment. Okay. Because of this, if we can design a directional response into our material, into our, our target, that means we've actually got a way of distinguishing between different types of background signals. You know, it, if we have other things like neutrinos coming in or different types of dark counts, and we'd, we'd expect those to be averaged out, but because we have this directionality prediction, we have a way of then distinguishing background signals over what would be a dark matter signal. So, for example, in, in the previous um, case, we looked at sapphire, and we know by looking at sapphire, it actually has, um, it's not a cubic crystal, right? We know that there is a primary crystallographic axis, um, and this is enough to give you a directional response in these sorts of materials. So there's three ways we can think about like having this sort of directional detection by design. Um, first is, of course, using anisotropic crystal structures like sapphire. 
Um, the second is, you know, obviously it kind of the, the extreme version of that is going to reduce dimensionality. So going to 2D materials like hexagonal boron nitride or TMDs um, can give you this sort of directional response. So here I actually have um, a picture of the charge density of hexagonal boron nitride. And on the right-hand side is, is the calculated um, uh, response over a day. So you can see um, on the x-axis is, is ranging from zero to 24 hours. Um, which is which is a day, so daily modulation of this response, and then the rate is on the y-axis. Um, so you can see here you get this modulation and rate depending on which direction your detector is pointing relative to this dark matter wind. Um, the final thing we can look at is then thinking about materials informatics and looking at having an isotropic dielectric response, which we've already seen is important for both the phonon and electron um, interactions with, uh, with um, dark matter. So this is another search we did in the materials project, which was to search for an isotropic dielectric responses. Um, and in this case, we started off with 7,000 materials that had dielectric tensors calculated. Um, we, of course, looked for um, materials that would probably be stable by looking at you know, a, a low threshold above hull. And we also looked at things that were monoisotopic. Um, the reason for this is that having different isotopes can cause um, uh, scattering. It can cause you to have um, actually decoherence inducing um, channels in, in your system. So we actually restricted our search to materials that had uh, that were monoisotopic. And from this then we, we found seven, 117 of those had, had a substantial amount of anisotropy um, in, in their dielectric tensor. So on the right hand side here I just have a, a plot of um, some of the materials with uh, our metric for determining how anisotropic these were, which was the difference between the calculated maximum and minimum um, entry in our dielectric tensor. And um, so you can see some of these materials here, this sodium arsenic material is, is one of these. Um, so we're currently actually refining this list and calculating these dark matter scattering properties um, in order to, to kind of down select for highly anisotropic materials. Okay. Really briefly mentioned before uh, um, finishing up this section, um, we, we also have been looking at um, how to detect uh, a, another type of dark matter particle, which is, or um, it's, it's actually a, a, a wave, um, uh, which is called an axion in multiferroics. And the reason these are interesting is because they have these E dot B terms um, in the Lagrangian, which is very reminiscent of what a magnetoelectric response in a material is. So on the right hand side here, I have what a lot of the standard searches for axions look like. So we've got an axion particle coming in and you have this B and E field in, in, in this cavity. And um, so these are cavity experiments. So what we said was, well, instead of having a cavity where we have these fields, why don't we search for a solid state system that also has this sort of um, uh, term in the Hamiltonian, but rather than having uh, applied E and B field, we have actually a, a materials response that has uh, electric polarization and magnetic polarization that are parallel to each other. Um, so we've actually identified materials with this sort of response as well. Um, finally, um, I, I'll discuss as well, um, we can look for a similar type of effect of looking for these types of axions in, in axion topological um, materials. Um, um, with Matt, I think, who's, who's our host today, and, and um, Nathan, who was the first author in this work, um, we're actually able to find several candidates using a high throughput search to the materials project in oxides. Okay, so I'm going to finish up the dark matter part here and um, briefly talk about how we can think about designing um, new multi-order topological phases using materials informatics. Um, and so, uh, Topological materials, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, they have properties that aren't, aren't described within conventional band theory. And um, so, you know, the canonical property is that in a topological insulator, the bulk is gapped, but you get these surface conducting edge states. Um, um, we have lots of different ways of classifying these types of materials. So band in topological band insulators are classified by internal symmetries like time reversal symmetry. Um, then you can start thinking about adding on crystalline symmetries like, uh, you know, rotational symmetries, mirror symmetries, um, to get things like nodal line semi-metals. Um, and these are all linked by a bulk boundary correspondence, like I mentioned, that the bulk is insulating where you have the, the edge states, of the, the, the conducting edge states. Okay, 
Um, and, and there's lots of searches um, for, for looking at these types of materials, just looking through symmetry indicators. And as I mentioned, we, we did this for magnetic and topological order in transition metal oxides recently using the materials project. Um, but what I wanted to ask was rather than just looking for topological materials, can we look for topological materials that also have other order parameters that we'd be able to use to tune the topological phases in these materials? And um, this is reminiscent of multiferroic materials where we have an electric polarization that's switchable by an electric field causing a ferroelectric phase and a corresponding uh, magnetic phase that's switchable by a magnetic field. So when you've got more than uh, one of these orders in the same phase, then it's called multiferroic. So can we think about, well, having multi-order phases that also include topological phases? And um, by topological, I mean electronic topological order. So what we want is a topological order that can be controlled by some sort of external parameter, whether that's a field or strain or temperature. And ideally, I want it in an oxide just because we know that our experimental colleagues are really good at making oxides. Uh, we can use MBE, we can strain them, we can do a lot of of different type of chemical engineering um, with, within oxides. Well, you can ask, well, I've, I've heard of topological oxides and there aren't that many, and there's actually very good um, chemical reasons why, because of the DP hybridization in oxides, you don't get that many topological oxides. And this actually caused um, Alex Unger to write this great um, commentary in Nature, of, it's actually two years ago now, of beware of plausible predictions of fantasy materials. Um, I think this is a really good warning for everyone doing materials informatics. Um, so uh, I guess in the next five minutes, I'm going to give you some plausible predictions of hopefully not fantasy materials. Um, OK, so this is what we want. So in, in ferroic type of, of systems, we require symmetry breaking. So for example, in a ferroelectric, we want to break inversion symmetry. But in topological orders, we require symmetry protection. So these are kind of the opposite types of requirements that we need for these types of systems. And so here in this um, plot I have on the x-axis is the control parameter. And you can see that if we want to break a symmetry and go from topological to, um, to trivial, uh, we go from a high symmetry phase to a low symmetry phase where we have this order parameter. So the example I look for is, is by controlling inversion, right? So for polarization, we require inversion breaking. Um, so we look for a topolo topological order that is preserved by inversion. And there's, this is all just showing you that there's lots of options and different types of topological phases that have this requirement where you've got some sort of uh, topological order that is preserved either by inversion or by a mirror plane. So this is the kind of criteria we need um, for, this, for this type of searching for a ferroelectric topological material. Uh, we want it to be metallic or close to metallic in DFT. And the reason for that is that one, topological insulators usually have small band gaps. Um, and we know already about the, the band gap estimation problems anyway. So it's kind of safe to look for metallic states. Um, and then we also want obviously a ferroelectric. So we want to find polar nonpolar pairs. And then, of course, we want topological band structures. And the way we're going to then select for that criterion is to look for non somorphic crystal structures. OK, so I'm going to actually kind of whiz through the next bit. Um, so Tess Smith, um, who's now at MIT, um, did a, a search, a high throughput search for, for ferroelectric materials. Um, and this involved looking at the materials project, taking in nonpolar and polar structure, uh, figuring out if they could be um, related to each other um, by interpolating between them. And um, she was also searching to see if they were metallic or not. So if they were metallic, she kicked them out of her workflow. And I said, could you give them to me? Because I want to do this topological search. So I was taking Tess's junk calculations and, and looking for um, this type of nonpolar polar relationship in these uh, nominally metallic um, ferroelectric materials. Um, so the next thing we did was look for which ones had non-somorphic symmetries, which can cause um, nodes. Um, I'm going to actually skip over this, but you essentially get something called band sticking, which causes bands to, to be degenerate at high symmetry points uh, when you have these types of uh, fractional translational symmetries in these materials. Um, and so when we did this search, we found 94 materials that were metallic with this polar nonpolar relationship. 24 had this non somorphic symmetry, and uh, one of them was an oxide, this yttrium chromium oxide. Okay, I'm going to actually um, skip through this and just show you the results because I think I'm running out of time. 
Um, it is in the hexagonal manganite structure. Um, we did calculate what the magnetic ground state and found two of these had, had a ferromagnetic ground state. Um, but the result is basically here. So in this case, we find that we get a topological state in, 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 um, in the high symmetry structure. And then when we break inversion, we get a ferroelectric where uh, we get a polar structure um, that, that causes these nodes to gap out. Um, so here is a summary. Um, in the top, we have this non-trivial case where you see at the Fermi level, we get these symmetry protected nodes. And in the bottom, we have when we break inversion um, and cause a polar structure, it gaps out to become a trivial insulator. And we actually see in, in, in real materials, uh, in hexagonal manganites, for example, we can actually get both of these polar and nonpolar structures in these um, types of vortex-like domains. Um, OK, so I think I'm at a time, so I'll just um, summarize here in, in thinking about, well, we can use quantum materials and materials informatics in particular to, to think about new materials and ideas for detecting these sorts of low mass dark matter particles. And I think it's interesting to think about, right? We've got 5% of, of the universe is, is like our standard matter um, and five times that is dark matter. So like, is there a dark periodic table? Can we start thinking about designing experiments that would start probing the properties of dark matter and how they couple with different types of orders and materials? And very quickly, I described how we can design new types of multi-order topological phases um, and, and think about like, dark, I call them the dark calculations and kind of information that was lost in high throughput searches were actually useful for different types of physics questions. So asking the right question can, can cause you to, to really uh, lead to new physical insights in, in, and, and new materials that have interesting properties. Okay, and I'm just gonna finish up here with the acknowledgements. Um, a lot of these people are dark matter folk and also some um, experimentalists and uh, materials experimentalists and of course the, the materials project who have collaborated with extensively on this type of work. And um, I guess at this stage it's time to answer some questions. Um, thank you very much for that Sinead, that was, that was a pleasure, that was a fantastic talk. Um, everybody please ask any questions you might have in the Q&A panel. Um, while the, the questions come in, I guess I just want to say that um, it's not at all obvious to me that a database like the Materials Project would be useful for tackling questions about fundamental physics. So that is really nice to see. Um, I think normally when we do material screenings, um, you know, we're looking for uh, properties for, you know, new, new devices or, you know, that, that, um, like batteries or solar and that kind of thing. Um, and it's really interesting to see in your talk uh, screening criteria that we don't normally see. For example, anisotropy because of the axis of the solar system or um, um, uh, like monoisotopic screening criteria. Um, it's just uh, something that I, I do not normally see in the course of my own work. So that was that was really nice. Um, thank you. Um, OK, so we have uh, one question, I think. Um, from uh, Ankit, uh, for high spin orbit interactive materials, can we look for transition metals for the detection of dark matter um, as transition metals like uh, nickel, lanthanum are highly correlated? Yeah, so um, there's no reason why we, um, why we, you know, we, we kind of were agnostic when we did our search. We, we used um, whatever was available in the materials project. So um, there, there is no reason not to include those. Um, but at the time, um, I think it was, you know, 4,000 or 5,000, um, uh, the, the materials that had spin orbit coupling included were originally selected to be those that we expected spin orbit coupling to be sizable. Um, so it was, you know, that kind of lower part below the transition metals that were actually calculated. But um, in, in, in theory, there's no reason that they can, they shouldn't be an interesting um, place to look. And of course, because we're looking at for low spin orbit um, coupled gaps, that would be a natural place to start thinking about. Um, maybe I can ask a, a, another question. Um, it's, so, oh, actually, sorry, uh, another attendee question came in. Um, as a non-specialist, curious to know how the total dark matter mass is known or predicted. And a second question, um, have you also considered magnons, which fall in the MEV energy range? Right, so the first one is, um, there's actually a, a, a kind of slew of evidence for uh, 
dark matter. Um, the one the, the piece that I like the most is looking at the rotational curves of galaxies. And um, so you can actually measure by looking at, um, you know, ob observational light. So, you know, things that we can actually see. And we can measure how much matter we expect to be in a galaxy um, by, by, you know, astronomical observations. But we can also measure how, how quickly um, our galaxies are rotating. And so in the same way, right, if you were to, I, I, the way I like to think about it, if you were to put like an orange in a bag and swing it around your head, you kind of know how much mass is in it by how much you need to get, to get the angular momentum running, right? And in the same way, we can measure the rotational curves of galaxies and know how much mass is supposed to be there. But there's a big mismatch between how much we expect to be there based on the rotational curves and how much we can actually measure uh, from, from observations of the matter that's there. And um, so that things like that of, of big deltas between what we expect to be there and different observations allow us to kind of narrow down what that, what that delta in, in mass range is. Um, the second is about magnets. Yes. So, so um, in, in exactly kind of think in the same way of thinking of phonons, um, you can think of other quasi particles like magnons. And they have uh, the magnons have the added advantage, of course, that they're also um, sensitive to spin type, the spin full dark matter. So um, they, they have this you know, extra added advantage. Um, the issue with magnon based detection is the readout. So we have ways of reading out. Uh, phonons using transition edge sensors, but the the strategy for reading at magnons is a little bit uh, it's a little unclear. Um, we're actually looking at uh, magnon to phonon conversion um, for that sort of reason. So if we could, you know, dark matter comes in, interacts with magnons, magnon converts to a phonon, and then we'd be able to read that read that out. So yeah, great suggestion. Uh, thank you. So uh, uh, Bella asks, um, does the directional nature of the wind, wind suggest that there is a dark matter source within our galaxy or universe? Um, there is not a source. It is. It is. It's. It's. It's not like a central um, emanating thing. It's not like there's there's uh, one place that it's coming from. It is because of our both of our um, galactic rotation and also the fact that our, our solar system is rotating that we get this directionality right. Um, so if I could ask just a, another question or two, um, so, you know, a, a lot of this work is being built on screenings, right, from a database, you know, containing maybe 100,000 materials, but in the scheme of things, that isn't very many materials, and you talk about things like tunability, and, you know, how important tunability is, so, um, you know, to, to what extent is that constrain uh, the work, and, and do you think maybe the ideal materials are, are materials that are you know, um, in these sort of intermediate compositions or something like that. Right. And, um, you know, I think actually this this is a kind of a philosophical question as well in, in the way we do these curves. So even in, in higher energy physics community, they put reach limits, right? So it's it what is the, the absolute limit of the sensitivity of this detector? And I think that's precisely what we're doing when we use these sorts of material searches is, well, here are the two endpoints, you know, but probably, you know, the Goldilocks might be some alloy in between these two. So I think we can actually use, use like carefully selected endpoints and uh, having this range of tunability as, as a good way, a, a good strategy for design as well um, for these types of, of, of applications. Um, and, and maybe um, I'll just end with, uh, what do you think is, is sort of the biggest hurdle in, in terms of taking this research forward? Is it things like, you know, practical things like computational time or how accurate our predictions are? Is it maybe things like access to tools, like symmetry tools, because, you know, a lot of this is, is, uh, requires, you know, very sophisticated analysis of symmetry, or is it more related to, you know, maybe our physical theories and our, and our understanding of fundamental physics? Okay, so I, I guess I'm going to answer in two ways. So um, if we wanted to make a dark matter detector tomorrow out of one of these, the biggest hurdle is, al is always going to be getting high quality crystals that are, you know, in, in a high enough volume to make this, this these sorts of cross sections reasonable and, and like uh, competitive with other types of proposals. So that's, th that's the boring answer. Um, the, the kind of more open answer is because we just don't know as much about dark matter as we do about real materials, I think the challenge is in materials. So I think really if we do want to understand material, like finding dark matter with materials, um, having really good understanding of what the quasi-particle processes are, how, how these different degrees of freedom interact with each other and how we can control them will be really essential for, for actually 
thinking about uh, finding more about what, what dark matter is because it, the material part is the bit we have control over the dark matter one we, we really know nothing about so um you know improving theoretical methodology for understanding things like correlated you know correlated quasi particle systems any sort of emergent phenomena these are all going to be opening up new directions in dark matter detection and i think that will be where the, the interesting stuff in the future comes okay um and to, to your first point um we did have one question from um, Eddie here about um, how important crystal quality is for the detection systems. I know that, you know, at the end of the day, we can predict many, many things, but, you know, it takes a lot of hard work to actually try and make them. So um, uh, I, I just want to end the seminar. So we're at, we're at the hour, um, but I just want to say thank you again for your time. I'm very glad that you could join us. And um, thank you everybody who uh, was watching and uh, asking questions. And I hope you can join us for the next uh, materials project seminar as well next month. Um, thank you again.